Welcome back to It's All About the Benjamins, a financial literacy series that's meant to take any fears that you may have concerning money out of your life. My name is Jamela Swift, and I'm a real estate agent with Keller Williams NYC, serving Manhattan and Brooklyn. Today's episode is called Protect Your Neck, Why You Should Never Sleep on Estate Planning. My guest for today is Lori Douglas. She is a partner at Douglas and Rademacher. Welcome, Lori. Thank you very much, Jamila. Thank you for having me. Thank you for agreeing to talk to myself and my viewers. I hope you're well. I am. I am. We're uh, hanging in there during these turbulent times, but uh, doing well. I'm here with uh, my son and our puppy. Okay. So uh, we're, we're hanging in there. So I'm sure you have been really busy considering that we're living throughout a global pandemic right now. Um, as I mentioned to everyone, we are discussing the importance of estate planning today. So Lori is an estate planning attorney. And now let, let me ask you, before we start this um, discussion, Lori, tell us what led you to specialize in this, in this arena of law? Um, well, actually, when I um, first when I first went to law school, I, I went planning to be a litigator. Uh -huh. um, my father became a judge, a New York State Supreme Court judge, when I was a junior in high school, and so I went to court with him, and I wanted to be in the courtroom. And uh, so I, I started out as a general litigator at a large firm, and then I came back to New York City, and I was an assistant district attorney in Manhattan for five years. When I was ready to leave there, I wanted to start my own practice and I wanted to pick an area that I could really concentrate my practice in the African American community because I wanted to be able to serve my community. And so when I looked around, um, one area was trust and estates. Mm -hmm. And um, sadly, in the, in the summer, the first summer after I left the DA's office, my best friend's grandmother passed. Oh, wow. um, and so they gave me that estate administration and other very good friends were having their first child. So they said, could you do a will? Um, so I started to teach myself and I went to my first CLE class. It was, uh, I want to say it was the summer of 1993, I think, on basic estate planning. And there must have been 250 lawyers easily in that room. And there was not one person of color at all period mm. and I remember thinking to myself gee I know a lot of black people who are gonna die right I bet you I could build a practice in this I could help our community because we lose so much of our wealth because we don't do planning and uh, and so I started concentrating my practice then and I worked for myself for a few years and then I went back to sort of learn it and so I went to uh, different law firms. I started at a small firm in Rockland County. Um, the name of that firm was Cantor with Goldhammer and Grafman. And then I went to a bigger firm in White Plains where I live. Um, and that was Kurzman, Eisenberg, Corbin and Lever. And then I went, I became a partner in 2006 in the Trust and Estates Department at Moses and Singer, which is a, 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 law, a, a major New York City law firm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, there I concentrated my practice and planning, and then I, uh, my son was getting older, so I realized I could go back into the courtroom. So I started adding litigation and uh, surrogates court work, and now, uh, you know, here, here I am many years later, really an expert in everything about the, the dead, planning for the dead, and then how to administer estates and probate wills and trusts, that kind of thing. And we also do litigation in right. surrogates. So you pretty much, okay, you, you said your focus is on the black community, but you pretty much welcome everyone, I would imagine. Right? Sure, yeah, we, we, have, we do planning for everyone, but we also, um, you know, we really concentrate a lot of our marketing, a lot of our speaking, um, a lot of, our, you know, our presentations in the African-American community. And then we also actually have um, a pretty big, um, uh, my partner, Kara Rademacher, came with me from Moses Singer, so we actually have a big, uh, practice and planning for business owners. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a, lot, a lot of women uh, like like working with us, uh -huh. maybe better than some of the uh, men, <laughs> T and E lawyers. 
And so we, we, we welcome anybody, but I personally really have concentrated building a practice in the African American community and serving our community. Right. So, you know, I've been selling real estate for 16 years now, and I've seen a lot of cases where people, especially in Brooklyn, um, they may own several properties and they think, oh, you know, uh, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And I know for a fact, I've given people your number before, and I'm pretty sure they did not call you. But here we are now, two months, two to three months in a global pandemic where close to 70,000 people have passed away suddenly. And I'm pretty sure a lot of the, the, the deceased did not see this coming like we all didn't and were not fully prepared. So I'm imagining that you have re received a surge in calls right now with people scrambling. So what do you say to them? I mean, hopefully there are people, your clients who have completed the process of, of starting the will, but let's say someone calls and you know, all of a sudden they're caught out there. What would you say or suggest? Well, um, so there's sort of two sides to that. There's the, you know, if a person becomes disabled but does not die. So there's disability planning. And then there is, you know, what you think of as traditional estate planning, having a will, having trust, mm -hmm. how you're going to pass along your assets. So um, on the estate administration side, the, the reality is if you pass without a plan, there is a plan. It's the state's plan. And then you you die in test state, and your your estate is just administered pursuant to state statute, with the state that where you were domiciled when you you passed. Mm -hmm. So in New York, for example, if you're single without children, and um, you die without any estate planning, your estate automatically goes in fifty percent shares to your parents, mm -hmm. as long as both are living. Um, that's one thing that shocks people. A lot of people feel like, oh, I have no kids. I'm not married. I would leave. If something happened to me now, I'd leave it to my nieces and nephews. Well, there's no way <laughs> money gets to nieces and nephews until it goes through the parents. It would have to go to the brothers and sisters, and then you'd get to the nieces and nephews. So if you don't have a plan, there is one, and oftentimes it's not what you would want. And, and it costs more money often to administer without any kind of plan. Right. But uh, that's, what, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but on the, on the disability side, it's really important, especially now, for people to have medical and financial directives in case you can't make your medical decisions or your financial decisions for a set period of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, powers of attorney from almost, I think for every state, if you can't get it on a state website, the, ju the, the title companies and the one I go to a lot is judicial title. They have updated um, powers of attorney on their website. People can you know, print them and execute them themselves. The same with a healthcare proxy or a living will or an agent for, um, to make your medical decisions, whatever your state calls it. The Department of State, for almost every state, they're online. You can just go to the Public Health Department, you can go to the New York State Department of State, New Jersey, whatever, and look it up and print those and execute them. So somebody can make your medical decisions and somebody can make your financial decisions. Sadly, this is the first time in the you know over 25 years that I've been concentrating my practice. This is the first time where the majority of the work we're doing is planning and not administration and probate. Because like you said, people are calling to finalize their plans. People who haven't called me in years are like, oh my goodness, Lori, I realize I need to call you. People who have never thought about it are now actually want to focus how quickly can we get it done. Whereas the probate and administration, sadly, the courts are backed up because they're not, um, they're, they're not open, in New York at least, they're not fully opening, open. And more importantly, and something I never thought of, is um, in this crisis, there are, there are no death certificates. They're not being produced timely because vital records can't keep up in New York City with how many they need to produce. And so there's a delay in the courts because people unfortunately are dying and being buried and there's no death certificate yet. So this is, is really a, a, a strange time, but 
um, we can we can get planning done. We're doing a lot of planning. And uh, in New York State, there's an executive order that allows for virtual notarization of documents as well as virtual witnessing of wills. Mm -hmm. New Jersey is only allowing for notarization, but we are doing the drive-by will execution. You right. sit the parties, you, you, you talk to your clients in detail before, and then outdoors a uh, you know socially distant execution ceremony. We've been doing quite quite a few of them. So someone who's called you out of the blue, they haven't spoken to you to you for a few years. They can finalize everything with you. They can have it virtually notarized, but it just won't be recorded by the courts because the courts are closed. Well, your estate plan is never quiet filed with the court. We don't ever recommend that because if you if you do a will, for example, and then you file it, record it with your uh, court, then if you change the will, you can't get that one back. And at the time of your death, if there have been changes, you now disinherited people, those people have the right to know about the will that was on file. And so we never recommend that um, once you prepare your, your estate planning documents, we typically keep the original will because we have vault space at Chase Bank where we keep everything. Um, and then we give everybody else their original documents. Right. Um, but the only one will, you only execute one at a time, don't make copies. And then that way, if you wanna make changes, you can just revoke the old one mm -hmm. um, and, and start fresh. So now I've been hearing a lot about trust-based planning and I happen to have a living trust. So can you tell us what is the difference between a living trust and an actual will? Or is okay, there so, so uh, first of all, living trust is a term of art. Mm -hmm. That is the term for a revocable trust. That's just the, you know, they can, people call them different things, but that's a revocable trust. And what a revocable trust is, is a will substitute. That means you have a vehicle that um, as long as it's written properly and you transfer your assets into that trust during your lifetime, on your death or in your case of disability, your trustees don't have to go to court. They can automatically access your um, assets and transfer them on death or, or pay your bills during disability as long as the assets are in there. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's called a will substitute, because it takes place instead of a will. So on death, now your trust is administered outside of the court. Mm -hmm. If a person does not um, put all of their assets into the trust during lifetime and they forget you have a bank account for $25,000 and you forget to turn it into the name of the trust, now you need a will anyway, because you're going to have to probate a will to get those assets from the estate and then pour them into the trust. Mm -hmm. So um, we do a lot more revocable trust-based planning than we used to because the courts are very backed up. And um, a lot of our clients, back when I started, New York courts were really very efficient. And a lot of people did will-based planning. But now a lot of people are moving to revocable trust, fun fully funding them so that way at the time of death, probate can be avoided. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to note, though, that trust-based planning is not just in terms of using a revocable trust or a will. That also means how you pass your property. So we do all trust-based planning, okay. whether it's within the will, then it's called a testamentary trust, or whether it's a revocable trust or irrevocable trust for different assets and different reasons but all trust-based planning, because that's the way you create the most generational wealth. That's the way to create protections from creditors for your heirs. That's the way to help prevent your kids from losing inheritance in a divorce. Mm -hmm. So we do trust in everything, whether it's a standalone revocable trust with a pour over will, or whether we build the trust into a will. So all trust all the time is our, our position unless clients really have some strong reason to pay outright. But we advise all, a lifetime trust always. 
Now, would a trust protect your property from deed theft? Because, you know, deed, deed theft, theft is rampant throughout New York City. And um, is it easier or is there more of a firewall because I have my, my assets in a trust? Well, to the extent that, well, it depends on what kind of trust, but to the extent that you have your, you know, you put your house in a revocable trust and you're the trustee, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're uh, subject to the same um, possibilities that somebody could take advantage and get, you know, these, these investors come along to elderly people and they, they sell their homes for um, a little bit of money because they don't really understand. If you're the trust, if you're the sole trustee, the same thing could happen. But having it in the trust does have protections, especially if you have co-trustees or the successor trustees. I mean, the, the transfer of the deed would trigger it to somebody else other than just, just the owner. Um, so for, for that reason, a, a trust may be more useful to prevent people from, um, you know, uh, transferring their deed or the ownership of their property and not recognizing what they're doing. But what, one thing, if, if people are gonna use trust, especially and transfer real estate, it's really important to use a lawyer who, who knows what they're doing because there are all kinds of tax consequences about uh, changing over the deed and with cost-based issues as well as there's, um, if, if people later on need to do Medicaid planning or are concerned about going into nursing home, you have to have the right type of trust right. in order to be able for it to be Medicaid eligible. So you wanna be very careful when, especially with real estate, especially your home. It's one thing, an investment property might be treated differently. But your personal residence, you really wanna make sure you're working with an attorney that understands the ramifications. So now what if someone doesn't really have the money right now to afford an attorney like yourself, would legal Zoom, would that be sufficient? Well, I, I personally, I, I don't want to promote legal Zoom because I've seen a lot of legal Zoom wills. And the problem is, is that, it, you know, it, it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't help to make it easy to just be able to answer questions and create the document if you don't really understand what the document is doing if you don't understand what, what the point of the trust is, if you don't understand all the different things about taxation and administration and ownership and how bequests should be written, um, you know, people, it's a, it's a lot to it. So I don't really recommend um, anyone to use a legal Zoom, but I suppose that's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for, for most people, um, you, you, there will be attorneys that can assist you in, you know, a, a price range that, that, that works for, for you. I have to say, I'm, you know, much more reasonably priced now than when I was at a large law firm where they build everything on an hourly rate, even drafting, you know, doc wills, and that could, you know, take hours and hours, and then you get a humongous bill. Um, so we, we are more reasonable than that, but some people might still think our flat fee billing is, is more than they want to pay, but certainly worth it in the, in the long in the run. Long run Actually, yeah. If you have real estate, if you have um, retirement plans, if you have brokerage accounts, insurance, and you know, a lot of people, if you have more than one child and more than one beneficiary, if it doesn't coordinate well, it, it, it can really be problematic when one person, you know, ends up with the house, but mom really didn't mean that. She meant everybody to get the benefit of it, but she just gave it to the daughter that lives with her because she thought that was easier. And then, you know, the, the one daughter now sells the $3 million brownstone in Brooklyn and doesn't give her brothers and sisters anything. Um, Wow. People always say to me, oh, that won't happen. And I always say, okay, well, yours will be the first family where it doesn't because it happened to every other family I dealt with before today. <laughs> and it turns into a huge mess. So, yeah. Well, it's good for, we're, we're really talking about the importance of just finalizing the process. I mean, because I would imagine that people have started the process, didn't see this coming, and they, they had their witnesses lined up 
and then boom, they're in the hospital due to COVID. Right. Scary thought. I mean, if they've gone that far, I mean, I would hope that the courts would recognize what has started. No, I mean, or well, that's the thing. You really can't if it's not in on paper. It it, it would be. You know, I think it's a slippery slope if the court started recognizing just, you know, doodles or handwritten thoughts or whatever, you know, there's, there are all kinds of statutory rules related to the execution and attestation of wills and the reason they, you know, have to be witnessed and there should be a self-proving witness affidavit and all these things because, you know, people, people are going to object. I mean, you know, I'm a litigator. So if there is an opportunity, I, I recently uh, got a call from a client where she wanted to make extensive changes to her estate plan, extensive, and she thought she had COVID. And so I was like, okay, well, the people that you're cutting out are going to definitely object to this because they're going to say, oh, you made these changes during this pandemic. So you really need to explain to me why we need to go through these bequests over the phone that are coming out. We need to get to go over everything. So I had to email it. And then we did a partial um, virtual execution. My son and I actually went to, to her and then we had another witness on the, on the phone. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we, we, we got it done in a few days because she wanted it, it done quickly and we got it executed. And we also, had a COVID scare as a result of it by both of us tested negative last week. Uh -huh. But, um, but you know, it, 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 it has to, you really ha have to finish it. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of litigation related to people who start wills or they type things out on their computers and say it's during COVID-19 and, you know, mm -hmm. um, I can't get to a lawyer but like i said you you really can do it now because the virtual um makes almost everybody has a smartphone that can do a zoom call or you know facetime um and i've had um elderly clients who we walk through how to download the app and ha on their phones and so they they've been able to do it themselves so what does the process of getting one's affairs in orders in order what does that entail so what would you need from someone who hires you? What documents would you request? The only thing we, we need, you know, when, when people contact us, we wrote a little ebook about the estate planning process. So we email that to uh, prospective clients along with an estate planning questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And that questionnaire really asks about your asset information, how you own things. So husband, uh, husband and wife or married people versus single people, how you each own stuff, um, who your dependents are, whether you have planning and effect, all those kind of things. And then uh, typically in a two hour meeting or virtual uh, meeting at this point, I can get all the information I need to draft a plan, which would include typically a revocable trust and a pour over will if you don't do revocable trust-based planning, then a last will and testament that has trust built in. Um, a living will, a health care proxy, a power of attorney, nomination of pers personal and property guardians. Um, you can create an appointment of an agent for bodily remains, if uh, uh, what, whatever the documents that, that we think are needed. Um, and then we draft the documents, send them to the clients, they review them, and then they execute them. And then the client is responsible to see that their trust is funded. And we right. do prepare deeds for an additional cost and we'll, you know, we'll prepare and file your deeds. Um, but things like your brokerage accounts, life insurance, all those things, you know, the client gets the change of beneficiary, whatever forms, and, and we help tell them how to fill them out, but then they're responsible to fund it themselves. So it doesn't take too long. It's not, it's not a difficult process for the client. It's more difficult for us, but it's not difficult for the client at all. They just have to tell us what they have and what they want to happen to it. <laughs> right, right. So I'm pretty sure that the process would be would vary for <clears throat> a person that is single, a person that a couple that is married, and then also a couple that has children. I had a client once who he had no heirs. Uh, he was single and he owned a huge building in Williamsburg. And so I asked him, so what happens, you know, 
when you pass along? And he says, oh, everything is in a trust. So, I mean, how would you? Well, well, first of all, they're only, you know, they're only two, diff two different kinds of people. I always say for estate planning, there are only married and single with or without children. Those are the only combinations you can ever have. Okay. So um, once, once you know what you're working with, then you can kind of figure out the best planning for that person. So for example, the person you just described, a trust is perfect for him, a revocable trust, because he's got assets and he says he has no family. Well, in New York, if you have a will, you must locate the closest family members. They are entitled to notice that the will is being admitted to probate. So for that gentleman, for example, if his closest relatives are second or third cousins, you'd have to do a kinship search. You'd have to look for them. You have to file an affidavit of heirship, all kinds of stuff, only for you know them to be noticed that he's leaving everything to charity, for example. So that's a perfect reason for a trust. It's a private document. It's not a public. And so you don't have the same requirements as you do with a will. Mm -hmm. Obviously, married people are treated differently. If you, you know, first question is always, was there a prenup? If you're, if you're married with a prenup, well, then I need the prenup. So the first thing is I need the prenup and I need to go through the prenup and I need to see if there's anything that's going to cause a huge conflict of interest for me to represent both parties in the estate planning. As long as they say, okay, then we can represent them both. Otherwise, maybe we only represent whoever contacted us. Mm -hmm. And so then for married people, you have to, you know, they have a prenup, then there are, what are the rules related to estate planning that apply to married people? You have to work through that. Then if they have children, are they children of that marriage? Is it a blended family? Those, are the, those can be some of the most complicated plans to create because often people with blended families do not have prenuptial agreements and the spouses never realize that just by saying I do, they've affected their children's inheritance. Wow. Yeah. And so, so basically that's why you kind of go through the, what, you know, what do you have and who are your people and who do you want to do? How, do you want to leave to charity? Do you um, only want to leave to charities? You know, if people make charitable bequests, that requires different notice. If there's a will, so then maybe that's another reason for revocable trust. Otherwise, you got to notice the attorney general's office and, you know, the charities. Charities have big lawyers. You'd be amazed how charities fight and um, can cause a lot of, of fighting and litigation and estate planning. Um, and so, you know, once you kind of work through all of that with the client, then we tell them the best way to leave their estate. So maybe, you know, you get some tax benefits if that's something you need. And so that it's organized and hopefully will lead to little, hopefully no litigation. I, I am, pride myself in the cases that come in as no litigation continue to stay no litigation. Right. <laughs> Th throughout, we get through the, the estate administration without having to go to court too many times. Right. Now, I've seen a, a couple of my neighbors, they, they were discussing this on Facebook, how they scheduled meetings with their families, um, COVID meetings, just in case if they're met with an untimely death, their children were present, their dogs were present for the meeting. Now, what would you suggest that people discuss? I mean, because I could see someone, you know, really getting emotional and, and not wanting to discuss this, but what topics should come up? Well, you know, I, I, first of all, I, I don't necessarily suggest <laughs> just discussing these things as, as families if you don't think that's conducive in your family. I mean, if you're a family where it's going to go, you know, so my parents' estate planning, it was going to be equal shares to me and my brother. It doesn't make much difference. It's equal. And he's a lawyer. He's a big time lawyer. He'd come shooting up at me, you know, as what I do for a living. I could shoot back. So we could have a discussion. But if you're in a family there, there are a lot of children and they all, and they, and they have different different understandings or they have different needs or often you have um 
you know, one the adult child that lives with mom and dad is often living there because that person cannot afford to live on their own. Right. So then it becomes a very difficult conversation. What's going to happen to the house when mom passes, when the one person who needs the house can't afford to live in the house and the siblings who, who can, can afford to take on the house don't want to have to carry it for their sibling right. and their inheritance. So, you know, if you're going to have the conversations, then ho hopefully everybody gets along from the conversations. And then I, I suppose I would just have a conversation about decisions related to, um, you know, related to healthcare agent type issues. Do you want to be removed from life support? How, how would you feel? I mean, nowadays, um, as somebody pointed out to me, one of my doctor clients pointed out, nobody's going to be asked if they want to be removed from a ventilator or put on a ventilator if they have COVID and they need it. If they need it and it's there, they will get it. If it's not there, they won't. So those questions that are normally in this healthcare proxy may not even be at issue um, during this pandemic. But I think people should talk about, well, what would you, you know, want us to do if you became disabled? Would you want to stay in your home? Would you want us to sell a home and put go to assisted living, those kind of things. And then in terms of, um, you know, distribution of assets, like I said, you can talk all you want, but if it's not down there, it's just going to be open for, uh, for litigation. Because I know, if I, I know if I'm the child who gets disinherited during a pandemic, I'm going to find a lawyer like Lori Douglas who's going to say, oh, mom was, you know, she was, it was undue influence. She was so terrified. She was incapacitated. All kinds of stuff happened. So um, if it's really not written down and, and done with counsel and done with best practices today, I, I think people are opening themselves up to, to litigation. So don't just have the talk. Do the documents. First, medical and financial directives, which everybody can get, a healthcare proxy, a living will, a power of attorney. Get those tonight. Go online and get them for your state. Fill them out. You can, um, one of the problems is those things can't be witnessed by anybody you're choosing to be your healthcare agent. So if you're quarantined with, with just uh, your family, you might not be able to have it witnessed. But, you know, you could, you could uh, put it in an envelope and take it to the neighbor and, you know, ring the bell and they can watch you sign it out there and they can in it and uh, you can get those documents executed. Right. Um, and in terms of estate planning, what things can be done if you can't get to a lawyer, you know, check your beneficiary designations, make sure they're the way you would want them to be. Um, check your deed. How does your deed read? It's, uh, you know, a lot of people don't understand the difference between joint with right of survivorship or tenants by the entirety or tenants in common. And so people should really understand how they own their property. Right. Um, uh, in addition to beneficiary designations, you can at the bank, you can, you can net put, uh, make accounts pay on death or in trust for. So if you wanna do that, reasons to avoid probate. Remember the will, the point of probate is to authenticate the will and that's how you can get to the person's assets. Mm -hmm. So if you don't wanna have to go through that process, you either have to have planning um, including trust-based planning, or you have to have your beneficiary designations, your joint ownership agreements, all those things in place. Um, otherwise, it's going to go under state state law. I would and, think also, I mean, this leads us to the discussion of end-of-life directives in preparing your, your family for that. Um, you know, I, I tried to have the conversation with my dad, but he wasn't really emotionally you know, capable of having it with me because parents automatically want to assume that the child lives longer than the parent, you know, goes mm -hmm. after the parent. But um, I would think that another topic to discuss would be what you, how you would like to be buried. I prefer to be cremated, but I mean, let's say if COVID wasn't an issue right now because it's just a huge mess with a lot of corpses, you know, trying to be located and identified. But I would, um, I would say 
definitely talk, okay, would you want to be cremated? Would you want to be buried? Um, well, well, I was going to say, so in New York, there is a, a, a document, it's called an agent, uh, appointment of an agent for bodily remains. Okay. And that would be the place that you would say, I want to be cremated or whatever. And one of the reasons is if, if, if you can execute that, and I don't know off the top of my head what other states specifically have that, but it's good to appoint somebody, especially if you may have family members that will disagree. So for example, you said you wanted to be cremated. Well, maybe your next of kin, does they don't want to cremate you. Right. So then you would want to pick an agent that is somebody that would follow your wishes and have your wishes um, down there. But also, um, in addition to um, a healthcare agent um, and living wills, there are also end of life directives that, that are state directives or federal directives. And so people can go online and those are specifically for end of life, do not resuscitate. But people can get those and they can you know, execute them themselves. So for you, you would execute the agent, the appointment of the agent and say, you know, you pick whatever me, because I know that you want to be cremated and you put your wishes there. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to discuss them with anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but you do have to, for the power of attorney, I mean, we always advise people for healthcare proxy to make sure you discuss it with the agents and make sure they accept the appointment. If they, if, if, if you make them and then they go, oh, I don't want to do it, then that's not helpful. Then you have to go to court and, and you'll have to go to guardianship court. That would be considered a, uh, an emergent situation. And so you could, you could file guardianship uh, matters now because it's exigent circumstances, but it would be best to have the documents created so you don't have to go to court. I think also... Uh, another thing that would need to be discussed is a lot of people practice different religions. You know, I've seen cases where the family may be Christian, but the deceased is Muslim, or even with myself, I come from a primarily Christian family. Um, some, some of my family members happen to be Muslim, but I'm Buddhist. So it's a totally different. Right, and, and, and that's why it's important to have these things because while you're saying it's good to have the talk, people don't have to honor what right. you talked about after they're dead. But if you have the legal document, then you have something to, to make them have to, to honor it. And it's especially one thing like, um, you know, if, if you don't, if you're a religion, you don't believe in blood transfusions or whatever, you're going to want a living will that reflects your religious um, desires and you're going to want a healthcare agent right. that knows those things because what you just said if i don't know you're a buddhist then i'm not going to know of things that would have been important to you right right and then also lastly um this is just something that I learned when my mom passed away. She passed away about five years ago. I learned the importance of having your name um, given to her banks, given to the banks. Like my name was not on her bank accounts. So we, came, we encountered an issue of me actually being able to gain access to, to her accounts. But luckily, I was able to prove that I was her daughter. But I would say also, I mean, I would think that that's another step. Is right. Well, I was going to say, you shouldn't have been able to access your mother's bank accounts by just proving your daughter. Maybe they took some kind of, are, are you our only child? Yes. Okay. So then they, they must have taken an affidavit of kinship that you're the only. But that's a perfect example. A bank account, if it's just in the parent's name, that is something that has to go through probate. So, you know, the children cannot access it once the parent, the parent dies without taking a will and, and, and having it admitted to probate. Or if there's no will, somebody going to get appointed administrator through the courts. Mm -hmm. So a bank account is a perfect example of something you want to be careful about because if you have more than one child and you put it one child on it for convenience, Right. let's say, but if the bank doesn't do it properly, which they almost never do, they almost never say for convenience only. They make the account joint 
with right of survivorship. And so what that does is by operation of law, when the parent dies, the surviving child gets the money. And I can't tell you again, you would tell, everybody says, oh, that won't happen in my family. But very, very rarely, I can't say never, but it's very rare that when that happens, the child whose name is on the account says, oh no, that was supposed to be split amongst the rest of us. That child always says, oh, mom meant for me to get that. And I have seen cases where the disparity is significant just in the way the mother had her accounts organized. She put this child on this one to help and this one on this. And then when she died, one kid got $100,000 and one kid got $20,000 and another kid got no dollars. And the, 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 the one that had, had already been deported to Jamaica was about to get cut out by his siblings up here. And then, I mean, it was just the mess. Um, so you really, those kind of things, if you, have, if you have one child, sometimes you can schmooze through these things. But if, if you have more than one or you're married or you're married with children that are uh, from, from a prior relationship, I mean, that's the most difficult um, administration. It happens all the time. People get married and they're only married for a few years and, and a spouse dies. And then there is just real hostility between the surviving spouse and the children of the right. deceased. Right. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Lori. <laughs> this was it's a, a lot. It's a lot. But people lot. should do it. And now is really a time. You know, people are home, you're, you're, you have time to pull out your assets, figure out how everything is owned and what you would want to have happen to it so that you can, you know, contact an attorney and get your affairs in order now. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a topic that people don't like to discuss. I, um, I know people have told me that, oh, that's so morbid. But to me, what's morbid? is grieving the loss of your loved one and also having to go on a wild goose chase going through their documents and getting everything in order that's more right and the, and the thing <laughs> is nowadays going through the documents you, it, you could literally not be able to there may be no documents right. maybe they get everything online they get everything if you don't have access to those passwords or whatever you know you have to go through a lot of steps before you can even contact the bank to say I need the information. My, my puppy is back. From, <laughs> she's back from her walk. <laughs> oh, okay. What's her name? Her name is Toby. Oh, that's And we, uh, we, we, act, we, we were actually very sick in January. I thought it was because uh, we probably had COVID. But I thought it was because our dogs had passed and we didn't have any dogs. So um, the day of, of Kobe Bryant's um, crash, I was actually in urgent care with Pink Eye. And I said to my son, ah, we need a puppy. And so I applied at one of the shelters. She was one of the puppies available and we got her at the end of that week. <laughs> Named her Kobe, C-O-B-I, in, in honor of Kobe and his daughter, Julie. She's saying, mom, let me in. <laughs> my, my son is out there walk, walking her. She's supposed, oh, to be there. Okay. supposed to be out there to, to give me some time to be on the call. <laughs> So I, I have all of your contact info for the viewers. Everything will be displayed in the description box below. Thank you so much. Lori. And also people, if people want to send emails, they can send me an email or an email to info at drstatecouncil.com. If people have questions or whatever, we'll, we can respond to, um, you know, questions via email. Okay. And people, please contact Lori. Like I said, I'll have her number and her web address below in the description box. Do not send your relatives on a wild goose chase. Just don't do it. Keep it simple, you know? Well, that's right, that's right. Thank you, Lori. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a good day. Take care, bye-bye.